Perhaps the most unusual battlefield hero in the entire history of the United States is memorialized here at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. She had four feet and her name was Reckless. This is her story. Reckless made her name during the Korean War in the most savage fighting ever faced by Marines, the battle for Outpost Vegas in March of 1953. Under intense fire, often alone and sometimes at night, she delivered load after load of ammunition to heavy rifle positions, often returning to the ammo dump with a dead Marine strapped to her back. The story of Reckless was first brought to the public in 1954 by one of her commanding officers, a writer by trade, Andrew Gear. Andrew Gear was a lieutenant colonel, and he was the uh, commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Marines. And he came on the scene in uh, just after March, after Reckless's most heroic battle. And he fell in love with the story, absolutely fell in love with it. And he became her press agent, really, if you think about it, because he's the one that wrote the Saturday Evening Post articles that got people to know about her in the first place. After the first article, there was a national outcry to get her home. And then his second article appeared a year later when his book came out. And it talked about her trip home and being the guest of honor at the Marine Corps banquet and all this kind of stuff. And so we just owe him a debt of gratitude. After Gear's death in December of 1957, Reckless was slowly forgotten by the public, much like the Korean War itself. But today Reckless is back, and we know her better now thanks to the deep research of writers Robin Hutton and Janet Barrett. You know, what struck me from the very beginning was that it was so much more than a horse story. It just wasn't about Reckless. It was about the guys and Reckless. And I just grabbed onto this story and I never let it go. Fate brought Reckless and her Marines together in October of 1952, when Lieutenant Eric Pedersen needed a pack animal to carry ammunition for his men during battle. The gun that Reckless carried ammunition for was called a recoilless rifle. It was also known as a Reckless rifle. First of all, as a contraction of its name, but secondly, because you had to be a little reckless to be associated with it. Because the back blast from this gun was so horrific that it identified where the Marines were when it was used. So incoming fire would be immediate. And you could only fire four to five rounds from the position and then you would pick up and hopscotch around the hillside because it was just, it was just too identifiable. This is how she got her name. The reckless rifle was critical in the effort to hold back communist Chinese pushing into South Korea. When positioned on high ground, the big gun could throw 75 millimeter shells several thousand yards with precision, destroying tanks and bunkers and clearing the way for infantry. But at 6 feet 10 inches and 115 pounds, the rifle took at least three men to move from location to location, and even more to keep it stocked with its massive 24 pound shells. The men who were ammunition carriers, they only had, could carry two, maybe three rounds of ammunition. And they would haul it up like a backpack. And they couldn't make a lot of trips because it was so heavy and the hills were so terrible. And that's why they wanted either a mule or a horse to help carry the ammunition up to the guns. In spite of her small size, 900 pounds and less than 14 hands high, Reckless could carry 10 shells at a time, deliver them faster, and keep it up for hours on end. No human could match that. But how could a horse, a prey animal by nature, tolerate battlefield conditions? They're supposed to run when, when things get tough, not stay in the midst of battle when everybody's getting shot down around them. The sounds are deafening. There are all kinds of smells and everything else. Horses uh, will desensitize to any stimulus, with something they see, hear, smell, feel, no matter how severe the stimulus is, they can be desensitized to it, providing it doesn't cause pain. Idaho horseman Harold Wadley was an infantryman in Korea. He saw Reckless in action, and he talked to some of the Marines in her unit. I said, how did you guys go about getting that mare the use of that 75, because a 75, when it fires, it has a 45-degree a uh, blast pattern that you don't want to be 50 feet behind that sucker because dirt and rocks and everything are coming out of the back blast. And they said, well, uh, we put her in a safe position right beside the gun, 
and cranked off a ramp and said uh, she jumped about four feet straight up and came down and said all you could see was really kind of the whites of her eyes and she was shaking so bad and said before she recovered from that the guys put another round in they fired four rounds and that mare never shook again and from then on she was a part of their battery the battle for outpost vegas in march of 1953 was part of a horrific three-day siege in which communist chinese forces attempted to push past marine combat outposts to capture the south korean capital of seoul the length and magnitude of this battle is hard for most of us to imagine Andrew Gear described the sound of it as 20 tornadoes tearing at a countryside. I had one Marine tell me it was mortars were falling like raindrops. It was uh, deafening. You know, we couldn't talk to each other, uh, sitting beside each other for the amount of incoming. Across rice paddies and up 45 degree hills, the little horse named Reckless made 51 trips from the ammo dump to gun positions carrying a total of 386 rounds, more than 9,000 pounds of explosives, and traveling an estimated 35 miles. Reckless was so effective at keeping the big guns going that one of the recoilless rifles overheated and had to be replaced. She almost had an impatient quality of, you know, hurry up, get me unloaded, let me, let me get back down for more. The guys that were wounded at the gun bunker, they loaded her with ammo, turned her loose, headed her up that ridge, and she went straight back up that ridge, hit a lot, a lot of machine gun fire and everything else. The guys unloaded her and tied a dead Marine over. She would take him back by herself, nobody with that mare. You can't invent what really happens in the world sometimes, and I think Reckless is an example of that. This prey animal has stepped out of what God made it, and became another kind of being. Because when she was not only carrying the ammunition up that hill in the midst of the horrible battle, she also brought the dead and the wounded back. I mean, this horse epitomized, leave no man behind. She was injured twice. They were both flesh wounds. One of the guys said to me, they can hurt plenty. They staunched the blood, the blood flow, and they dressed the wounds as best they could. I mean, this is, you know, in the midst of battle. And um, without any, any ado, she went back. And she got two Purple Hearts for that. And they were authentic Purple Hearts. All of her medals stand. They were given to her, and they're, they're honored in that way. The horse cannot associate the pain of the injury with the noise of battle. They don't understand that the shrapnel that she was hit with is coming from the same uh, source as the noise. So therefore, you should continue to not to be afraid of the noise. And the injury was just something that happened. It takes human reason to understand that I've got to duck load to avoid the shrapnel when I hear that noise. Lieutenant Pedersen assigned the care and training of Reckless to his trusted gunnery sergeant, Joe Latham. Latham was experienced with horses and did a good job of preparing Reckless for what lay ahead. Under his guidance, she learned to step over barbed wire and communication lines and to take cover on command. I really give Joe Latham a lot of credit because he put her through hoof camp. And in hoof camp, he even taught her to run to the bunkers when incoming was coming. All he'd have to do was say, incoming, incoming, and she would bolt. She would go to the bunker, she knew where her bunker was, and she knew how to get down in the bunker. And that's just amazing. I mean, people, you know, they say, how could she do that? But it was because he had trained her so well. It got to the point with him that he was able to give hand signals, and she would obey them. I mean, that's how close their bond had become. The Marines became her herd. By the time the Korean War ended on July 27, 1953, the little horse named Reckless was known throughout the Marine Corps. Her story reached the general public through the writing of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Gear. In Reckless, Pride of the Marines, Gear admittedly embellished upon the facts he could learn about Reckless's early life. Especially her early story with the young Korean man Kim Huk Moon, who, it was his horse, 
and he had to sell his beloved horse to the Marine Corps to buy an artificial leg for his sister, who lost hers in a landmine accident. But Gear's book is considered a reliable account of what happened after Reckless joined the Marine Corps. The details of all of the um, trips that she made, the different battles she was in, and so it allows us then to go and research those to get more details he might have left out. Physically, Reckless was a small horse, technically the size of a pony, with a sorrel coat, blazed face, and three white stockings. Although she has been called a Mongolian horse, Barrett and Hutton believe she was bred on the island of Jeju to be a racehorse. I think it was very easy to say that Reckless was Mongolian because the Mongolian pony for East Asia is, is the breed that is known best. If you look at breeding charts, it, it factors in many of, many of the other breeds. But there was no evidence to say she was, and I believe she was Jeju because the Jeju pony was the indigenous and predominant equine of Korea. None of this is in Andrew Gere's book, so we really don't know the breed. We're kind of basically guessing from the region and things like that. But the island of Jeju is off the south tip of Korea. And they bred horses there. They bred the little Jeju pony. They also bred thoroughbred there. And they would race. They'd race these horses. And Reckless was bred to be a racehorse. And she was very fast. And she was, she was very smart. But she never had a chance to race, because when war broke out, she was just two years old. Life as a Marine meant many new experiences for Reckless. And on her off times, not in battle, she would carry communication lines, she'd string communication line, she'd carry grenades, she'd carry anything that they needed her to carry. They treated her as one of their own. They fed her bacon and eggs in the morning, she'd chase it down with coffee, and this is in the mess tent. They fed her Coca-Cola, and her favorite thing from the sea rations was Hershey bars. She loved chocolate. A lot of the things, if they're sweet, horses will eat them, even if that's not what we usually consider horse feed. It's not a natural diet for the horse, and I, I would suspect that uh, in the case of Reckless, there was probably also grazing that went on, grass out there. Horses are highly adaptable. She was especially adaptable. Reckless loved beer, and the guys, <laughs> the guys drank Goebbels beer. Uh, brewed in Detroit, and they said it wasn't so great, but she thought it was just fine. Um, the water in Korea was horrible, and so the ration was two cases a month for each guy, and um, she pretty much knew where the guys kept their, kept their beer. She would go to the officers' club. I mean, they would bring her. Um, she would go to, to rotation parties when someone was on, on his way home. You know, she had her beer, she had mixed drinks, she had a little whiskey. Um, yes, they got her drunk a few times, yes. When her Marines came home from Korea, Reckless came with them, and she lived out the remainder of her life at Camp Pendleton near San Diego. The standing division order for the 1st Marine Division was this mare will never have anything on her back again but a blanket, so that she is through carrying anything. The PFC in the best physical condition in the Marine Corps, he was to trot beside her five miles every day. They bred the mare, and she foaled two uh, little guys. Uh, one was named uh, Fearless, and the other one Dauntless. During her 16 years as a Marine, Reckless was promoted through the ranks to Staff Sergeant and was always treated with a respect befitting her rank. When she was at Pendleton, and if she was led in a parade, you couldn't lead her if she outranked you. So, you know, so it really, it was really just cute how they just stuck to these wonderful traditions with her and treated her as the Marine with the same rank as anybody else. She died in May 1968, just shy of her 19th birthday. It was unfortunately an accident, a barbed wire. She got, in, got tangled up in some barbed wire. They had to put her down, and um, it was decided very quickly. There was, no, there was no undue debate about putting her through any sort of arduous and, and, uh, and difficult recovery. Uh, she is buried at Camp Pendleton, and um, three years after her death in 1971, um, the 1st Marine Division Association put up a large grave marker and held a memorial service. Again, she was a Marine, Semper Fi.
But for author Robin Hutton, that wasn't enough. In 2009, Team Reckless was born with the goal of creating a larger-than-life memorial at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. Sculptor Jocelyn Russell was commissioned to create the statue. I sent her every picture I had. She read my book. She read Gear's book. She read everything and started to build the, uh, the monument. And we decided, you know, what, what do we want her to do? Do we want her climbing the hill? How do we want her? And it was during Outpost Vegas as if she's trying desperately to get up to her men and deliver the critical ammo. I have to tell you, she's brought me to tears so many times in 22 years. And, and now I hear other people say they cry all the time. I mean, you just you think about something she did. And it's not that it was sad, it's just that it was just so noble or so powerful and suddenly I well up. She has a hold on me, she still does. I've made it my mission to get people the world over to know about this horse's story. This horse has changed my life. I thank her every day. The comment that has stuck in my mind from several of the guys, um, because of Reckless, men came home from Korea that would not have otherwise. And there are probably a lot of them walking around still today. I mean, she did, she did for, for those guys um, what they could not have done alone. Books and articles about Sergeant Reckless are available online.